Good morning. Welcome to the service today. Let's all stand, please, to page number 60. Page number 60. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. Face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory I shall see him by It's good to see you. Good to see this good number here, and we so appreciate you being in the service this morning. Of course, those that continually listen uh, on the Internet, we appreciate you as well. And we want to go to the Lord in prayer. We do have a couple of special prayer requests. Remember uh, Sue Collins. This is uh, Angie's sister-in-law uh, who is dealing with Bell's palsy but also a potential cancer issue. Uh, so be much in uh, prayer for her. Uh, prayer for her and her family. Also, Brother Dean will be having surgery this week. And then let's especially remember this police officer who was uh, shot in uh, Kernersville last or this morning. I uh, don't know a lot of details other than they did, uh, on the way over here, uh, I heard that they did uh, catch the suspect. He was, uh, this person was at large, but they do seem to have caught him. So let's just pray for this police officer. And also, uh, Carol Hayden has a special prayer request. So Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for our time together, and we thank you for this opportunity that we have to just come and worship you. Lord, we pray that you'll clear our minds, and may we focus on the things of God. Uh, Lord, as the singers sing and as the preacher preaches, Lord, uh, stir our hearts, Lord, and give them uh, the words and the messages in song and also the message that we need to hear uh, to just draw us closer to you. Lord, if there's someone that doesn't know Christ as their personal Savior, Lord, touch that heart, we pray. And Lord, for the uh, request of prayer, Lord, there's just so many <clears throat> that have special prayer requests and uh, so many are dealing with issues and, and uh, sicknesses. And Lord, we just pray that you'll intervene on their behalf. Give them that comfort and that grace, Lord, that they need. And Lord, we especially pray for the lost that don't know Christ as their personal Savior. Lord, just meet with us this morning. And we'll praise you for it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just uh, have uh, one uh, uh, announcement of the continued announcement <coughs> for the cookbook. Uh, we have now, Stephanie, I believe you said over 100 uh, recipes, right? 
143, and the goal is at least 200, correct? So if we can get over 200, the preacher won't be able to put his lard gravy recipe in. Uh, so y'all keep going. <laughs> but uh, anyway, continue uh, uh, submitting recipes, and we're looking forward to the cookbook as we celebrate our 100th uh, anniversary this year. That's, that's a long time. Uh, and so we've, we've been very blessed. So it is good to see you this morning. Maybe a ramp recipe, right? <laughs> All right. Oh, anybody have a birthday this past week? Raise your hand. Happy birthday to Claude Ray. Um, I hope everyone got through all the ice okay for two weekends in a row. I lost power for three days. It was fun, to say the least. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, only one will not do, born again means salvation, how many Be much in prayer for the special music.
Amen. Praise the Lord today. What good music. Uh, such a blessing. And uh, so good to see everybody today. Uh, uh, several more back in our service I see. And thank the Lord that you're here today. God's given us a beautiful day to start with. And then uh, we're really blessed with the sunshine of God's love and care. And uh, I certainly uh, am so sorry many times we, we struggle, it seemed like in recent days, Brother John will tell you, with, uh, with, with uh, our system shutting down right when we need it the most as far as uh, Facebook and so forth. And I, I think it's probably not even running, not even working now, not live now. We do appreciate those that uh, do watch later on, of course, but yet it's still frustrating and uh, we're Brother John and I are talking about considering going a different direction because it's a shame to be paying for this service and constantly having to struggle, uh, not knowing that the system's going to be up, and there's really no excuse for that. So uh, anyway, we're going to try to rectify that problem, but we're just, we're just glad you're here today, and we're planning on having a good service for the glory of God. Now, take your Bibles today, if you would, please, and turn to the book of Luke, chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> and uh, I, I appreciate your prayers. Last Sunday was an embarrassment, all that crazy drainage I had. And uh, now today, after taking all kinds of medication, and including a whorehound drop <laughs> that Sister Cheryl gave me, hopefully I can get through this. I told somebody this morning, I said, did you all come today for entertainment? <clears throat> But Luke chapter 12, looking beginning at verse number 13, let me begin at that passage of Scripture. The Bible says, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he may divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed. And beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room to, uh, where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you today for this service. We thank you that uh, I'm sure most of us today in this service would say, thank God I'm on the winning side. And we thank you for that side, that winning side. And the winning side is being on the side of redemption, of knowing the Lord Jesus. I pray now your blessings upon this service. Help us, Heavenly Father, to give some serious thought to the issue of life itself and to realize that true wealth is not found in material things. Dear Lord, bless us now and meet needs, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I'm amazed at how Brother Bruce, for some reason, does not like my recipe of lard gravy. See, we're talking now 100-year anniversary, right? Well, 100 years ago, that's what people ate. So I just want to remind you that that, that recipe of mine is really uh, has historical value to it. Uh, it. It surely did get a lot of us through those years back years ago when we didn't have a whole lot of other things to eat for breakfast. But uh, that lard gravy must have some nutrition in it. But uh, I can still remember it was good stuff. Mom would make it in an iron skillet. And uh, she did. She used a lot of lard and of course, flour and milk and so forth, and it turned out pretty good. It really did. But uh, anyway, that, won't, that little advertisement won't cost you anything. But I'll be disappointed if that's not in the recipe book, though, because of the historical value. 
Uh, what I'm doing this morning is changing things around just a little bit in terms of a title that you may expect, but yet you're not getting. We're told that the ground of a rich man brought forth plentifully. And so the question would be, why would I call this the story of a poor farmer? The man was a farmer. The man had a good crop. The man was successful. And he's actually called rich. But as the message develops this morning, I hope that we will see that he had riches in one way, but he was poor as Job's turkey in another way. You pardon the expression. He was really poor. This parable addresses the subject of the value and meaning of life. It begs the answer to James' question when James said, What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then vanisheth away. This parable makes us think about life. It makes us evaluate the true essence of life. It makes a person consider what does life really consist of? What is the real meaning of life? The parable expresses the philosophy of humanism where man describes his own course and his own fate. The man in this parable, this farmer in this parable, he talks about what he will do. He said, I'll pull down my barns. I'll build greater. And so we see that the parable is, is laced with materialistic thought. He's thinking what he will do. The philosophy of humanism, which basically decides life's course and fate. The philosophy, like was expressed in that uh, poetic selection years ago, I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. The farmer was rich according to earthly standards. But spiritually, he was poor. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse number 15, which of course is in the, ver in the passage, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Oh, how important it is to know that. Longfellow wrote, uh, wrote the poem, A Psalm of Life back in the 1800s. In fact, it was published in 1838. The poem that Longfellow wrote, it was written to inspire the readers to neither lament the past or to take for granted the future. Now, as far as the spiritual, spirituality of Longfellow, I'm not sure. I, I know that he wrote poetry. Some of his poetry... Uh, <clears throat> consisted of, <coughs> excuse me, here we go again. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> I was given instructions last Sunday when I drink water. Don't just take a little sip, just take a good gulp. Try that and see if that'll work. Is that okay, folks? The poem <coughs> that he wrote, actually, it did touch on the meaning of life. In fact, his poetry inspired the song. I, I saw the bells on Christmas Day, you know, the, the, the Christmas carol. But uh, he wrote a poem called, and I'm bringing this up uh, for sake of illustration, a psalm of life. He said, life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust returneth, was not spoken of the soul. Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts though stout and brave, still like muffled dreams, or drums are beating funeral marches uh, to the grave. <clears throat> lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime, and departing leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. So the poem would remind us <clears throat> that life needs to be taken serious. It would remind us that we're leaving footprints in the sands of time. It would remind us that uh, 
that, that, that dust thou art, dust returneth is not spoken of the soul. It would remind us <clears throat> that the soul lives on forever. And a person's life is not to consist in the abundance of things which we have. The irony of this parable or the irony of this story is that the narrative doesn't match the reality. The narrative doesn't match the reality. The narrative says that it talks about the grounds of a rich man. But in reality, the man was poor because according to Jesus, this man was not even rich at all. In fact, in verse number 21, it says, So he that layeth up treasures for himself is not rich toward God. So Jesus literally lays out the case that the man really was not rich toward God because he had been laying up treasures for himself. Treasures that are laid up for man's benefit are temporal and will be left to man will be left behind to man. But treasures laid up for the glory of God are eternal. Chapter 12 again, verse number 21, he that layeth up treasures for himself is not rich toward God, but treasures that are laid up for the glory of God are eternal. Matthew chapter six, verse number 20 says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So the Bible says lay up treasures in heaven. And I'll tell you that's where our attention needs to be. We need to be more focused on eternal treasures than earthly treasures. We can appreciate things. We can thank God for the blessings of material things but we better not hold on to them very tightly because everything we have will be left for someone else when it's all said and done. I'm sure, going back now to this account, this farmer was a good farmer. I believe the man was hardworking. I believe he was an honest man. We have every reason to believe that he was successful in what he did because his barns were full. This man had a good crop. I mean, in fact, his barns were so full, he was deciding he needed a building program. He needed to put in bigger barns to take care of all of the produce that his farm was producing. He was hardworking. He had an honorable and honorable occupation. He was a rich farmer and could have very well had the biggest and the best farm in the county. He even ran out of storage space. He was rich in the things of life. He was called a rich man. We see that. He actually was called a rich man, but he would die and leave behind his things and God called him a fool. He's actually called a fool. I mean, if we would base his life story upon his possessions by human standards, anybody would have said that Mr. Farmer Brown, I'll use that name, has really got a great farm. He really has been successful. I mean, people, let's imagine, people would drive for miles maybe to look at the standards of this farmer, to maybe talk to him, to find out his reasons for success. He was a successful farmer. He had things, but not character. He was a poor farmer all along. He had things, but not character. I want to, this morning, divide my thoughts with three particular points that I would like to mention. We're talking about the poor farmer. We're talking about the rich poor farmer. We're talking about a farmer that in reality was poor. So I'll call it this. Let's look at the poor farmer's materialism. His materialism. Verse number 16, the ground of a certain man brought forth plentifully. His materialism. He was a rich farmer in the eyes of man, 
but he was a fool in the eyes of God because God called him a fool. This man in this account was literally called a fool. Now that's not very good to be called a fool. I mean, no one would, no one takes it very lightly if someone looks at you and says you're a fool. That's just, you know, one description you don't want to hear. And most people, they'll, it'll, 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 uh, they'll, it'll rouse them up in a hurry. If someone looks at you and says you're a fool. Now, this one in the account is called a fool. It's bad enough to be a fool, but it's worse than bad enough to die a fool. I mean, it's really bad when you call a fool, but it's worse than bad when you die a fool. See, that's what you call double whammy. This man <clears throat> lived a fool, and this man died a fool. I mean, he, if he would have got his life straightened out with God, then <clears throat> he, could have, he could have come out of it in the end. He could have still gone to heaven. He could have still pulled in, so to speak, the loose ends. It could have still, his life story could still have had a good ending chapter. It's terrible when you think about that. His life story turned out to be a total disaster. Chapter one all the way through the remaining chapter. He died a fool. You know, a fool, according to the Bible, is a person who lacks spiritual discernment. A fool is a person that mocks at sin. Psalms, or Proverbs 14, verse 9, fools mock at sin. Also, a fool says there is no God. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1, fool has said in his heart there is no God. Now that's how the Bible describes a fool. This man was a covetous, materialistic fool. He was covetous. And you know, covetousness has been called the sin that, where there is no conscience. Where there is no conscience. This was a principal sin of this man. He was materialistic. It's okay for a person to work hard it's okay for a person to build their barn. It's okay to have things until those things begin to possess a person. This man here was a fool. Someone wrote, Here lies John Rackett in his wooden jacket. He kept neither horses nor mules. He lived like a hog. He died like a dog. And he left all his money to fools. Now, you know, there are many people today, I don't know why this thing's rubbing. Maybe I need to stick it on my nose, maybe. How would that look? I'll change it over here, all right. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people today who are extremely smart and make lasting contributions to society. Brilliant people. I'm thinking of, those that have invented things, inventors, scientists, engineers, astronauts, brilliant people with great minds that have done so much. I watched this past week, and I'm sure some of you did on news, of the space ro rover that was lowered to planet Mars <clears throat> and began to send pictures back to this earth. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? That in our lifetime, we're seeing the ability of astronauts to literally uh, send a spacecraft all the way to the planet Mars. It takes brilliant people to uh, send a spacecraft millions of miles through space and then pinpoint landing on a remote planet such as Mars. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> they, they, there's many. In fact, there's no doubt in my mind there are many 
Christian scientists, many Christian uh, astronauts even, I'm sure. But it is troubling to me that evolution beliefs, though, do so oftentimes bleed through when it comes to space exploration because it seems like they cannot give a report as far as any detailed report when it comes to uh, like landing on Mars or even going to the moon or whatever to where they don't have to throw in their billions and billions of years equation. They'll talk about the fact that on the planet there's a lake bed, but billions of years ago there was water in that lake bed. And that's evolution. That's evolution. I would think that there should be more of a tendency to go the route of creation rather than evolution when you consider, when you consider the ability of, of, of scientists, of engineers, of, of uh, astronauts, in being able to travel 30 million miles to the planet that's the fourth planet from the sun, the planet Mars. Think about this for just a moment. Well, I'll, I'll preface what I'm going to say this way. Because God, as a creator, has laid certain laws in place, and everything is in order. Man can calculate. For example, we have the solar system. We have the planets orbiting around the sun. We have the planets making their, revel their, their, their rotation cycles and revolving around the sun. And everything is precise. We, on our, the planet Earth, we're now in wintertime. And isn't that an amazing statement? Y'all, I don't see anybody in short sleeve shirts here today. Cold is wintertime. Our seasons. Our seasons. Uh, the rotation of our earth, the revolution of our earth, we have the, we have the seasons. We, have, we use a clock. We, we go by time. Now why? The answer to it all is the amazing creativity on the part of God. We can calculate because everything is in order. Now to make sure that the spacecraft, think about this. Mars is in orbit around the sun. But to make sure the spacecraft that we send and Mars, the planet, arrive at the same time, the spacecraft must be launched in a particular window of time. A particular window of time. If the space, spacecraft is launched too early or too late, it will it'll arrive at the planet's orbit when the planet is not there. That'd be embarrassing, wouldn't it? <laughs> then when the spacecraft is launched, it cuts back on its engines, it, it just simply drifts. Then eventually it falls in line with the gravitation force of the planet, and it uses the gravitation force to speed it up, so to speak, put it in layman's terms and pull it down towards the planet. There's just so much in play. But I've said all that to simply say this. One thing I'll say, I'm not an astronaut. I didn't really do that well in science in school. But I, will, I have enough common sense to know this, though. Because God placed these planets in space, in orbit, <clears throat> and there are set <clears throat> cycles of time, the rotation cycles, that an astronaut can set down and make his, or, or, the, or, or the people at the Space Center can set down and make their calculations and literally send a 
spacecraft, 30 million miles through space and pinpoint a precise place to land that thing on a planet that's a fourth from the sun. Rather than look at the genius of just the astronauts, let's look at the genius of the creator God who does everything decently and in order and makes possible that we can use our calculations. We can know when seasons will arrive. We have a clock on our walls. We have a, a watch on our wrists. Because we live in an orderly universe that God gets credit for. I find that amazing. But God called this man a fool. A fool. Now, you know, fools, some of them are smart. I believe that there are fools today in the highest positions of this land. They're smart, but they're fools. A fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Fools make a mock at sin. Let's let the Bible define what a fool is. You can have 15 degrees on your wall, and you can have all kinds of recognition in this land and accomplish great things, but in the eyes of God and in light of Scripture, you're still a fool if you mock at sin. You know, even fools say something Worthwhile now and then. Somebody said uh, even a blind pig can find an acorn sometimes. This man was a rich poor farmer. This man reminds me of the church of Laodicea. In the book of Revelation chapter 3, uh, the Laodicean church, it says, Because thou sayest I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So the church said, I'm rich. But God said, you're poor. You're wretched. You're naked. We could call this farmer a rich, poor farmer. His materialism. Secondly, let's notice his mindset. Verse 17. He thought within himself that that can be dangerous. He thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. I'm struck by the two words, no room. He should have also, I'm also struck by the words, what shall I do? It should have been, what shall I do to be saved? What shall I do? No room. He thought the ground was his ground. His thoughts didn't leave home. Think about it. They didn't leave home. He thought with himself. His thoughts didn't even leave home. He thought within himself. He was eat up with meitis, wasn't he? Meitis. Twelve times, twelve times in this passage of Scripture, the words I, me, or my are used. Eat up with I, Idas. Ever hear this? I had a little tea party. You want to quote it for us? Carol and her sisters grew up learning that poem in elementary school. Her mother taught her. I had a little tea party this afternoon at three. Twas very small, three guests in all, just I, myself, and me. Myself ate up the sandwiches while I drank up the tea. Twas also I who ate the pie and passed the cake to me. <laughs> Cute, isn't it? But it's one thing we miss. A preacher has to use, make an illustration out of it too, though. It's also I, I, I. I don't mean to insult your cute little poem. Somebody said a self-made man is the best example of unskilled labor. Pride's the issue. Pride. Pride. That's 
that's a killer. Some people would rather be the head of nothing than the tail of something. Now, you know, uh, you know, everybody, at least a lot of people, is conscious about food, about dieting, about what to eat, and so forth. You know, dieting is important. Now, how does this relate to my message? Just listen. When it comes to dieting, I know something that's very healthy. Swallow your pride. Uh, and it's non-fattening. You know, I've known some people, and I really have, some people so proud they could strut sitting down. This man said, no room, no room, no room for me to bestow my fruits. No room. His problem was there was no room for God to. No room. When Jesus was born, no room in the inn. This man had no room for God. He didn't have any room to bestow his goods, but his worst problem was no room for God. He said, I will say to my soul. That's verse 19. I'll speak to my soul. There's a problem that he had. He thought he had a monopoly on time. He thought he could have a conversation with his soul and he thought that he could lay out his life ahead of him. He thought that he could put everything in line according to his plans based upon his own time scale. He thought he could do all of the arranging. His philosophy, eat, drink, and be merry. That's verse 19. He, he didn't, uh, in his calculations about his life, he didn't think of the future uh, quite far enough. He thought of the future, but he didn't go far enough with it. His future was earth. His future was while he was here. His future was planning his barn, building his barns, bestowing his goods, and doing all of those things. He planned ahead, but he didn't go far enough. He left off eternity. You know, what you have or what you are is more important than what you have. Never forget that. What you are is more important than what you have. Then finally, I want you to note this. This man's uh, materialism, this man's mindset, but now what about this, man, this poor farmer's miscalculation? Oh, it's terrible. Verse number 20. Verse 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? The man's miscalculation, he was off on it. You know, I, I can remember when I was a teenager uh, in, in high school, and back in them days, I was a reckless kid. I didn't know the Lord, and I lived dangerously, to be quite frank, frank with you. But I remember the time in high school when seersucker was in fashion. Y'all remember that? Seersucker clothing? And I, I wanted a seersucker shirt. And finally, my mom bought me a seersucker shirt. But at that time, I didn't have Christ. And I really thought I was something wearing my seersucker shirt. Now, that's a tongue twister there. See, I was lost without Jesus Christ. You know basically what I was? I was a lost sucker in a seer sucker shirt. <laughs> Best way I know to put it. This farmer here, he has a nice farm. It's growing. He's building barns. He's doing all of that. But before he knew what hit him, People were fouling by his casket, looking down at him and seeing how natural he looked. 
while lawyers were squabbling over his estate. I don't mean to get sidetracked here, but people usually do things like that at funerals. How natural that person looks. You can't convince me in a million years that a dead body looks natural. Nothing natural about that. But that's beside the point. But this man here, th things were rolling for him. And, you know, I wonder what killed him. Doesn't say, does it? But I just know God said, Tonight thy souls will be required of thee. You see, while he was patting himself on the back, he should have been kicking himself in the shins. He was living it up, but he couldn't lock it up or take it up with him. He left it all behind. He miscalculated the arrival of death, and neither can any of us. None of us can. He went out of life as skimpy as he came in. He came into this life wearing his birthday suit, and he went out that way. You know, he lived like a fool. He died like a fool, and that was the greatest tragedy of it all. He met a requirement, though. Verse 20, thy soul shall be required of thee. He met that requirement, but the problem was he met the requirement of a fool. The only thing this farmer winds up owning when it's all said and done is a cemetery plot. That's all. Little old plot in the ground. That's what he winds up in. And I say to all of us this morning, we can build our houses, we can make our plans, we can stack up on material things, we can plan our future, but not a single one of us today in this building knows when God's going to take us out of here. And God's the one that does it. He put us in this life, and he's the one that takes us out. I don't think we're going to leave one minute earlier than what God intends, but none of us know the exact time. And, and I, I think we ought to work as hard as we can. We ought to take pride in our houses. We ought to take pride in how we look because I believe after all we need to manage the property that God's given us. God's a good manager. But the day that we start worshiping what we have, the day that we start thinking this is all there is, we're in for a rude awakening. You see, a person who's a millionaire and a person who just can barely get by materially, when it comes to death, they still leave on the same footing. And, and I'm not talking spiritual. They leave on the same footing, and, every, and the millionaire plus the pauper both leave behind what they had. The millionaire might leave his millions, and the pauper might leave just a few dollars, but the point is they both leave it. And that's why it is so important to invest our lives into something that will outlive this life. He wakes up in hell. He leaves everything behind. He finds himself poverty stricken. He found out too late that trust was more important than treasure. His fortune was on the wrong side of the river. Wrong side of the river. He came to the river Jordan of death, and the problem was his fortune was on the wrong side of it. He found his only real estate was that cemetery grave. Cast not eyes on earthly treasures, from our hands they soon will pass. Hearts redeemed with his salvation brings real hope <clears throat> that's sure to last. And that's where <clears throat> it ought to be. This morning, <clears throat> though we may not be live, but those will be their folks will be watching it after the fact. I say to everyone listening today, do you know for sure you've been saved? Do you know for sure there was a time in your life you came to the junction, you knew you were a sinner, you believed that Jesus took your sin debt and paid it in full, and you trusted him by faith, you believed on him to the salvation of your soul? Can every one of you that are here and out there say, I know for sure, 100% for sure, 
that God has saved me. If you can say, I'm sure, you're making a statement that's worth billions to know the Lord and to have the peace of God. But if you're not sure today, you need to settle it. You need to come to the cross. You need to realize his provision for your sin. You need to accept what Christ did for you and for me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. Keep building your houses. Keep building your barns. Keep gathering your goods. But do so knowing you're going to leave it all behind. But it's only what's done for Jesus Christ that's going to really count. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And God's people are praying. I wonder if there's anyone here or out there in computer land that are watching, listening, that is not really sure about being saved. Could I help you as much as possible? Would you be willing right now, if you've never been saved, would you be willing, and I'm speaking to you that are here and those that are out there, would you be willing to pray this sinner's prayer from your heart? Knowing you're a sinner, simply pray out from the heart, Dear Lord, I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died for me. I'm a sinner. I'm lost. But come into my heart and save me for Jesus' sake. If you'll pray that prayer from your heart, if you're an unsaved person, will pray that prayer from your heart, God will save you. Did any of you pray that prayer from your heart this morning in this building? And you'd say, preacher, I accepted Christ as my Savior. Just did. I asked him to save me. Anyone here? I, I always like to close with an invitation or anyone out there. Now today for us that know the Lord, as we have an invitation, if you'd just like to come and pray at this altar and ask God to help you with something, maybe today <clears throat> you just need to come and say, Lord, I've been putting too much attention on things that have no eternal value. And help me today to get my thinking rearranged my calculations to get, get them better and focus more on the things that mean the most for God. So we have an invitation. If you feel like you need to come and pray along that line, you do so. Father in heaven, bless this invitation. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Mike. 282. <laughs>